If you're trying to build muscle and bulk up without losing speed or getting any slower, you need to have the right things in place and the right program in place in order to make that happen. Because I know so many people have probably done this, I did this myself in the past included, where you go into like a bodybuilder or just like trying to build as much strength as possible and then you go back out on the field and you're slower. Well, we're gonna make sure that doesn't happen. My name's Nick Lydon, I'm a certified strength and conditioning coach, owner of the Peak Performance Program, Athlete Academy, and I train at an actual college with hundreds of athletes. So I'm gonna show you the method that we use inside of the Peak Performance Program that is gonna maximize the amount of muscle that you're going to be able to build, but also plan it and sequence it with how you should be setting up your speed and agility or speed and acceleration training in order to make sure that you can build muscle and get faster, okay? So before we get into the actual structure, the workout program, what goes in it and the methods behind it, we need to understand what are the main things that drive our two goals, which are going to be building muscle and maintaining speed, AKA getting faster. We should all be trying, we, you can get faster. You, we can do it, you, you just set it up right. Okay, so I've talked about this in other videos. I have a full how to build muscle without losing your athleticism training with an actual program breakdown in there with the, the different types of contrast training, sled sprints, all that type of stuff that you can go grab, I'll link it below. But when we're talking about building muscle, the biggest, the king of all muscle building is making sure that you have enough what's called mechanical tension on your muscles in order to get the adaptations that you want. So mechanical tension is just the tension that's on a muscle or the force acting on a muscle as it is lengthening or trying to resist the lengthening. So you can get that with any sort of simple progressive overload type training where you are adding weight, 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 and making sure that you are either equating the volume or the reps and, and you're adjusting it for that, okay? But again, if you want a full deep dive into all of that, go check out some of the other videos. So mechanical tension, if you don't have sufficient mechanical tension through your training program, you will not build muscle. It's just simple facts. Just like if you are not eating in a calorie surplus, you will not build muscle, okay? so. The big thing, mechanical tension, once you have that mechanical ten uh, tension and you have that in your exercises that you choose, the second driver is called metabolic stress. So that's like that burning sensation that you kind of, you, that you feel. It's an accumulation of metabolites that can kind of spark your body's uh, like hormonal response. Okay, you get that with mechanical tension, metabolic stress. But if you don't have mechanical tension and you just have metabolic stress, meaning that you're not hitting the threshold higher, uh, than what you previously were to build that muscle. If it's just metabolic stress, it's just not gonna work as well. Same thing with like DOMS and all that. Mechanical extension must be present in order for the other two to actually help aid and kind of assist with it. And whether they aid and assist, research is still 50-50 on it, okay? So we, now that we got that clear, right? We, we, cool, we know we need a progressive overload. We know we need to have mechanical tension. Now, when it comes to our nutrition, Okay, there's a thousand different types of diet plans and all this stuff out there. The one thing that you need to understand is that the big key factors for you are going to be fueling your workouts, meaning that you're not in a calorie deficit, you're actually in a surplus, okay? Think of your body as, right, like after you do the workout, you have all these, these, these workers ready to build a house, ready to rebuild, but if you don't provide them with the wood, the nails, the tools, and, and everything that they need in order to build that house, it's not going to happen, right? And vice versa, if you eat a bunch and you have all this wood, all these nails, all these building materials, but you don't have the workers around to assemble it because you didn't train, you're not gonna build a house. It's just gonna lay there, sit there, and accumulate, and AKA become fat, okay? So a very simple method or very simple way to think of this. Now, the big thing I wanna stress with you is that Everyone's metabolism is gonna be a little bit different. Everyone's training how hard they are, how many calories are gonna be a little bit different. So when you are initially selecting your calories, you can use a calorie uh, counter online or calculator online. Or what I recommend, and when either my clients are doing muscle building or fat loss uh, as their secondary goal in terms of outside of their performance goals in the gym and in the field, I have them track all of their food, all of their things that they drink, so they, for the next seven to 14 days, 
So they know every single day how many calories they had, how much protein, carbs, and fat they had, and I have them track their weight along with that. So I can see the adjust, like see how it's fluctuating, okay? So at the end of it, you take the averages, right? You're like, okay, cool. On average, I ate 2,000 calories and I gained, or I lost, say, a pound, okay? Then I can go, okay, cool. He was at 2,000 calories. He ended up losing a pound. So roughly, not always, that he was in a 3,500 calorie deficit and because 3,500 calories roughly equates to about a pound. Now there is water weight and different things that can influence like sodium and stress and sleep and all that stuff. But it's just a general good rule of thumb that can put you on the right track with it. So I know now that they ate 2,000 calories every day, their weight can fluctuate every other day, but on average they lost a pound over those seven, over those seven days. I know that 3,500 divided by seven is 500 calories. So that would mean that their training or the amount of food there that they're eating was negative 500 calories a day. So they were minus 500 calories a day. So if you're trying to build muscle, we want to make that, you would want to eat anywhere from 28, maybe up to 3000 calories. It really depends on you. That's why I always recommend you're tracking your weight as you go because a good rule of thumb, now newbies will be able to build a little bit muscle quicker and different things like that but you should be looking for anywhere, if you're a little bit in the more novice, about 1% uh, of your body weight in pounds of muscle growth per week, which is definitely high, don't get me wrong, that's really high, but the more kind of average would be right around uh, like a half a percent to 2.5% of your body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you're gaining a pound of muscle a week. That way you're not just putting on fat, you're actually building lean muscle. Um, other things that are helpful are to do like waist measurements, arm measurements, chest measurements, okay? Looking in the mirror so you have more data points to see how your actual body is actually changing. And then you'll adjust your calories uh, based around that. So if you are not building the muscle at the rate that you want and your fat's not going up, you can increase it say 100 calories next week or 150, 200, as long as you're keeping those measurements and realizing that you're not just gaining fat. That's why the measurements are, are good because if you are just building muscle, you're not necessarily going to like get a bigger waist, okay? It'll actually probably stay the same size. It might even go down a little bit. It just really depends if you're losing any amount of fat along with that, with the training, uh, with that, okay? Now, when it comes to your macro breakdown, you need to fuel your workouts. Your workouts are gonna be intense. They're gonna be hard, especially they're gonna be using Primarily two energy systems, which are your, your creatine phosphate system and your anaerobic system. So what fuels the anaerobic system are your carbohydrates. And what also carbohydrates also help do is they will peak hormones in your body that are more inducive to help support muscle growth. So doing any keto bullshit is not gonna be the way to go. I mean, people have done it, it's just not a, as effective as could be. And if you're looking to optimize and make it the most efficient as possible, we wanna have a high carbohydrate, high protein diet with some adequate fats in there. So a very simple way you can do this is do anywhere from 30 to 40% protein, 40, maybe up to 50% carbs, and the rest coming from fat. You just wanna make sure that you're at least getting a gram of, of protein per pound of lean body weight or body weight. If you're a little bit heavier, obviously you don't need to go that quite that uh, intense because there's some diminishing returns. And the added amount of carbs that you are having, it has a protein uh, sparing effect in it, which will help you out with that, okay? But high protein, high carbs, adequate fats, roughly low end 15 up to 20 percent is kind of what I, I found the sweet spot for when i do a 40 40 20 split so 40 carbs 40 protein 20 fat percentage uh it seems to work pretty well for me okay and then the last thing right is recovery people forget this so much you have to be able to recover from your workouts in order to get the adaptations that you want so if we think about it right we have our our stimulus right that's like the training everything we're doing the stress in your life all that stuff that's the, the stimulus that's kind of on our body we have our adaptations uh kind of or not adaptations we have your accumulation phase this is where your body's kind of like 
getting a little beat up. There's a slight performance decrease, right? You're kind of getting adjusted to it. And we have our recovery over here, right? When we have all of these, meaning that we're training hard, we're getting adequate stimulus and a recover, and uh, we have that recovery that we want from it, then we get our adaptations, AKA muscle growth or getting faster, more powerful, whatever the goal is for yourself, okay? You have to be able to recover for it. Big things, sleep, gotta get your sleep in. Hydration, they're like the two biggest performance uh, supporters that there are along with adequate nutrition. Now when it comes to speed, there's, there's, there's a little bit more, okay? The, the lowest hanging fruit for speed is improving your technique across the board or maintaining, right? So like if you need to get faster or you're trying to maintain speed, one thing that I recommend is that you focus on the technique for the three different phases of the sprint. So there's your start or acceleration phase, transition phase, and your top speeds phase. And they all have slightly different variations on how your feet are contacting the ground, the shin angles, body angles, um, and, and what the primary technique is for that, okay? So after that, we have power. Every athlete needs to be focusing on power in order to get faster or how much force they can actually apply into the ground. So having some strength training, having power development in there that is gonna be more lower body and sprint specific is going to help you with that. One thing that we love is sled sprints, and I'll talk about those later, that later. The next thing we need to have is stimulus. This is why so many people get slow when they're doing bodybuilding or straight strength training. They're in the gym 24 seven, but they're not going out and running because your body needs to have enough stimulus, just like over here to, to build muscle, get stronger, you need to be getting the, uh, enough frequency of acceleration training, of top speed training in order to maintain or get faster with your speed development. <clears throat> when it comes to stimulus, I also wanna note that that also includes the intensity of it as well. When you're training for top speed, you're trying to get faster, you need to be hitting 95% of your top speed or better in order to get the stimulus that you need to tell your body hey, shit, I need to get faster. If you're below that, you're basically conditioning, okay? I mean, you're not basically, you may, might be doing technique work that's a little different, but in your body standpoint, you're not hitting the threshold in order to get faster, and you're just working either technique or kind of conditioning yourself uh, in, the, in that energy system that you're doing, okay? The next thing, again, recovery. When it comes to recovery, this is like big plan recovery, so your central nervous system is fully relaxed, fully ready to go, fully recovered, so yeah, you can hit that 95% or better with your training, okay? And then we also, and then this also, in terms of how much you're resting, you have to rest way longer than you actually think uh, in between your sprints so that you can actually hit that top speed that you're going for. So say if you're doing like a fly 10, which is top speed, pure top speed, uh, you should be resting anywhere from like three, four, five minutes. It, you, your, your best time, say it's a second, you can't run slower than a point or 1.05. If you do, you're not working top speed. That's how small that actually is. Now, the other thing that you can do is work on your elastic strength. So that's the amount of free energy and energy that you get from your tendons. That'll help with the transfer of force into the ground. So plyometrics, great for that. Mobility, okay? Mobility will help in terms of improving your technique overall if you have a lack of mobility. That's how that will work. And then like I talked about, you need to have acceleration-based focus days and then top speed-based focus days and some technique in between. So what does this look like in terms of actually the structure of what we're doing in the gym and on the field? So I'm gonna break this down for you right now. This is a method and this is the actual program that we are using in our next phase of training in the peak performance program where we are focusing on more of our muscle building phase, but we have athletes who are playing rugby or soccer or <coughs> lacrosse and they need to maintain their speed and potentially get faster. So we're gonna break this down and then I'll show you the structure of the week layout. So with our gym, we wanna get a dynamic warm up. we wanna prime our body, open ourselves up, whether it's lower or upper body, you can choose the splits for yourself, whatever they end up being. Then we're gonna get into some plows. It's not a lot of plows, it's maybe one, two, three sets, wherever you're at. We usually have one to two uh, extensive plyo metrics like pogo hops, things that are keeping you bouncy, working on your ankle strength and stability and elastic strength. And then we have like one extensive plyo metric where it's like a box jump for max vertical or broad jumps, repeat broad jumps, bounds, things like that. Okay, again, not a lot of volume. 
two to three sets, two to three reps, maybe four, maybe five tops. After we get that done, you should not be tired and, that, and those plyos should help prime your body and your central nervous system to be able to produce maximal force and strength. Because on the next thing that we're gonna be doing is we're trying to maximize that mechanical tension piece, build strength and force, which we need for our, our speed work down here, right? But also providing the stimulus to help build muscle. So we do a wave loading set for our main lifts. So a wave loading set is simply an example would be doing like seven, five, three. Okay, we have a couple ramp up sets or warm up sets to get there. And then we are choosing the, the, the ad, or not adequate, but the percentage based off the one rep max in order to be able to hit that. Okay, so it's descending with the wave loading. We are trying to go heavier and heavier with this. You're trying to rest three to five minutes, but for example, it's like a back squat, right? So you would do seven reps at that percent, I don't have it off the top of my head, I'll put it up over here somewhere. So it's getting heavier and heavier with that mechanical tension, the amount of stress and strength that you're building, okay? After that, we're gonna get into a unique method. This method shouldn't be used for long periods of time because it is really demanding. It does work the mechanical tension and a lot on the metabolic stress. There's a lot of time under tension with this, but it's called a 6-12-25 method. So if we did squat pattern here, Typically what I'll do is the opposing or antagonistic muscle group. So I'll do something posterior chain here. Okay. So when you're doing the 6, 12, 25, you have three different exercises. Okay. Large compound movements, or you can have uh, an accessory isolation movement towards the end. Okay. But everything that you're doing has a slow negative or eccentric portion anywhere from three all the way up to six seconds if you can, um, but that's where we're maximizing that time and attention. So if you're doing that slow, how you should be, you're gonna be choosing a weight that's two, three, maybe four uh, <clears throat> rep max higher, okay? Something that you could hit for maybe eight to 10 reps, say for the six, right? And then for the 12, maybe it's 15, 16 reps that you could hit, and then 25, that's all about just like blowing the, like getting the pump and, and burning those muscles out and fatigue and then creating a lot of metabolic stress there. So an example of this would be like a heavy RDL with the eccentric for four seconds, okay? Right after that, immediately into the next one, maybe 10, 50 seconds tops just to transition time, you're gonna go into another supplemental exercise that's gonna hit the hamstrings or the glutes. So if you did a heavy RDL, you could do something like a hip thrust, okay? You could do uh, like uh, leg, leg curls, line leg curls, something like that. And then you can move into your, your 25 was where you can choose one of those accessory exercises. Again, this could be like a single leg hip bridge or a hip bridge. Uh, it could be, uh, you could hit the hamstrings again any way you want to and how you can set that up for yourself. You just have to have a few of those exercises. It doesn't need to be exactly the same muscle group every single time. It doesn't need to be hamstring, hamstring, hamstring. It could be hamstring, glute, alternate back and forth. Same thing with the quad. You can add a little bit of variation in that as long as it's all the supporting musculature and that, and that main muscle that you're hitting on that six is, is still playing a support role and helping aiding the force production and lifting of that weight. Okay, so typically three sets, maybe later you go to four. But after the 25, then you take a big long rest, three, four, five minutes before you go into it again. So no rest through each one and then a big long rest at the end. Again, it's opposite of what we did for this, okay? And then finally at the end, we have a little bit of a complex, which is just another uh, like triset or superset, but we're not trying to stimulate uh, much more like fatigue on the system. It's really like prehab work, shit that you don't normally do, right? Mobility work, um, and then maybe an accessory exercise to hit the quads and something that you hit back up in the main wave loading set that you did, okay? And then you'll switch that and I'll show you that later when we go over the workout structure. Now when it comes to our field days, the breakdown's pretty simple. Dynamic warm up, okay? We have a whole series on that. You know, you got your A skips, B skips, you got your, your, your knee hugs, all, all that stuff, right? You're getting all, all your dynamic warm up in. Then we're going into some little bit of plyos, so some power development. Again, start uh, extensive, so hops, forward, back, side, side, priming those ankles. Then we go into extensive where we do some bounds or you do some double bounds and things like that, okay? 
Next thing we're gonna go into is technique work. Again, remember, we said technique is gonna be the biggest thing for you if you do not have it. So whether you're working your acceleration or top speed, you are gonna work more technique geared towards that. Things like wickets or three cone starts, four cone starts, single leg push-offs, things like that to really emphasize the technique that you're, that you're going for later with the actual uh, speed development that you're doing. And then finally, we got our acceleration or top speed with it. Okay, now I'm gonna go over the layout and workout structure because it really depends because again, if this speed development is the goal, we need to make sure we structure it right so our body is primed and ready to go. So let's go over the overall week breakdown and there are some subtle variations that you can adjust and make for yourself, but here's a template for you. So day one, you're gonna be focusing on top speed. Okay, get in there go or go out there, 45 minutes an hour, get the most amount of speed highest intensity that you can get everything you can out of that session because it is going to tax your central nervous system a little bit but not too much but we need to be the most fresh and that's why we have it on day one day two now we're going to get into our lower body strength and, and muscle building workouts so we're going to start that wave loading that main strength set or that main strength exercise is going to be a squat pattern okay it's going to be a squat pattern it could be front squat back squat, whatever you want for that, okay? After that, then you're gonna go into the posterior chain like I talked about, glutes and hammies, okay, for your six, 12, 25, and then finish it up with the complex that I, that I talked about, okay? Day three, now you're moving to upper body, okay? So you're gonna do a, a pull variation or any sort of back movement for your wave loading. You can do like a pendulum row or bent over row. Then you're gonna, your push is going to be a 6, 12, 25. Okay, so like dumbbell incline plus chest flies plus push ups, right? You could, or dips, right? You can even hit the triceps with that if you want uh, a little bit in there. And then your complex and accessory movements. Day four is a recovery day, okay? So I uh, have an active recovery sequence or a recovery day that you can go watch if you wanna know what to do on those recovery days. I'll put the link down below. Okay, then we're gonna move into day five, which is your acceleration focus. Okay, the reason we have it set up this way is because we give ourselves a little bit of a break here in order to hit maximal power and intent with our acceleration. Okay, so we have our acceleration focus day. Again, things that I like, if you, if you, these three things will help you more than anything. Resisted sled sprints where it's pulling behind you or hills or stadiums. Run those, very simple. Okay, do that along with the technique and, and stuff that I talked about, okay? Day six, now we're gonna move into a lower body. Now you're gonna hit the posterior chain uh, for, for your main lift, like that RDL uh, that you can do, or deadlift, or hip thrust, whatever you want, there's your main strength lift. And then your squat is going to be the 6, 12, 25 method that you can do. So you can do variations, you can, if you did all bilateral here, you can do some unilateral movements here with lunges, step ups, things like that. Okay, day seven is gonna be your upper body. Your push is gonna be your main lift. So you can do bench press, overhead press, whatever it is that you want for that main wave loading set. And then your pull will be a 6, 12, 25. So like a dumbbell single arm row, lat pull downs, face pulls that you could do in that order. Okay, now I would typically recommend like day eight might be another recovery day, uh, just so you have a little bit more time to feel good for this, you have at least 48 hours for your legs to recover before you hit top speed. Or one thing that you can do is on this day, right, you combine day five and six, you can go hit acceleration first and then come back later and hit your lower body. We always wanna make sure that we're running first before we do our lifts. We don't wanna lift before we run because then we're not gonna get as much as we can out of it for that speed session that we are doing and then you would have that extra day of rest that I talked about if you combine those two. So then you'd shift day seven over and then you would rest before your top speed day, okay? So this is the exact program, but it's obviously a lot more built out with the exercise videos, the progressions of the wave loading, the progressions of the 6, 12, 25 from week to week inside of our peak performance program. If you wanna learn more, go ahead and click the link below and I'll see you in the next video.